Hello everybody, my name is Rasul and in this video we are going to talk about uh, Plotinus's theory of emanation. Let us start with an introduction about Plotinus. Uh, known as the founder of Neoplatonism, Plotinus was born in Lycopolis, Egypt in the year uh, 204 or 205, it varies in historical books, and he died in uh, 270 CE. In the year 245, he moved to Rome and wrote the Ennats, which is his masterpiece. Uh, basically, he didn't write all those pieces as one book. He wrote treaties, he wrote them separately uh, over a long uh, chronology. And then they were put together and made a book, uh, which was very influential in, in, in the Greek and Western and also Islamic Christian uh, Judaic uh, philosophy and theology afterwards. We will talk about that. Um, his chief student was Porphyry. He arranged the Ennads after his death. Porphyry actually rearranged the book. He changed the order. He arranged the book into six books, each consisting of nine treaties. Uh, hence the name Ennads, because Ennads in Greek means nine so um, that that that's in allusion to nine treaties that this book the solastic book is named and not so six books each containing uh, nine treaties uh, this book was so influential that um, like in previous videos i said studying islamic metaphysics without understanding ibn arabi's doctrine of unity of existence is impractical and here uh, we have a similar case, studying Greek metaphysics and also Islamic without knowing Plotinus's uh, theory of emanation would be very difficult and impractical to some extent. So it is of paramount importance to understand this theory and this great thinker's frame of thought. Plotinus was actually uh, Egyptian, uh, but some people think of him as Greek. And the reason for that is that uh, all he talked was basically within the framework of uh, Greek philosophy. He took Plotinus's, sorry, he took Plato's doctrines. He trimmed them, he cleaned them, like he chopped here and there, um, and in a very unique way produced a new doctrine. That is the doctrine of the one or the theory of emanation. At the time after Plotinus's announced the world of uh, philosophy, especially Greek philosophy, was not the same anymore. It changed into Neoplatonism, that is taking Plato and making it uh, in a unique, uh, trimmed, original, new way, in a way to way. And uh, he is known as the father of, of this movement. Uh, this presentation is actually part of my thesis. I wrote my uh, master's thesis on the doctrine of unity of existence in Ibn Arabi's uh, Seals of Wisdom and Plotinus's theory of emanation. Uh, in one of the chapters, I dedicated to uh, Plotinus's theory of emanation. So this presentation is the result of that. Uh, Again, I'm not gonna give the final conclusion that I, I that I draw from from this project. That is for me, and the rest is for you to decide. I don't want to give you any impressions here. I'm just presenting uh, uh, my findings and what Plotinus actually thinks. My focus in this presentation is on theory of emanation, uh, but with a special focus on the unity of the soul with the one, with the priest uh, hypostasis, which we will discuss. Uh, especially in the Ennads, in the book Ennads, and specifically in Ennads 3, 4, 5, and 6. Among the commentaries and secondary sources, I will be investigating uh, Corrigan, Gerson, Haddad, Inge, and O'Brien's books. Let us start talking about the theory of emanation. Let us see what this means. And, my hope in this video is to give you a clear picture of this doctrine. I do not intend to defend this theory. I do not intend to reject this theory. All I'm doing is clarifying the theory. Whether you think this is right or not, that's for you, not for me to make that judgment. I have a judgment, but I will not announce it in this video. My purpose is just clarifying the picture, giving you a fair picture of what this theory is. So let's get into it. 
uh, there is this term Plotinian and it is reserved for anything related to Plotinus. Uh, for example, we have Platonic uh, or Platonist that is related to the thought and philosophy of Plato. So there is a difference. They sound, they may sound similar. We got to be careful here. Uh, Platonic or Platonist and we also have uh, Plotinian. Plotinian is related to uh, Plotinus's thought and philosophy. So in the Plotinian cosmology, there are three principles. He calls them the three primal hypotheses, um, and they are, in order, the one, the intellect, and the soul, capital, all of them. Um, he says, as its organizing principle, each level of existence needs a higher degree of unity. For the world of senses to have an organizing principle, it needs a higher level of unity than what it already has. And, and that the higher level of unity comes from the second hypostasis, that is the intellect. And for the intellect to have an organizing principle to exist and uh, to be, in generic terms, uh, to, to function, it needs a higher level of unity than what it has. And that is the first hypostasis or the one. We will discuss them in detail for now, just this is a preview. Now, how does this theory of emanation work? So let us start with this question. How does the one, the first uh, hypothesis, produce the other hypotheses? That is the second one, intellect, and the third one, the soul, capital. Um, Plotinus says, intellect, being, and soul emanate, and this is a technical term, from the one. Emanation means manifestation. It means pouring out. So what he's saying is that the one emanated, the one manifested itself, or sometimes he called it himself, and produced the intellect, the second uh, hypothesis. And then the second hypothesis, the, the emanation continued for, until it reached and produced uh, the third hypothesis, this soul, capital. And from there, this emanation continues up until uh, through the soul, small letters, uh, not capital, through the soul, and this souls, until the level of uh, material world, this, this world that we are living in. So this is the basic picture. There is a hierarchy. There is a manifestation from top to bottom. The top being the one and the bottom being the material world, this world. Um, Plotinus says the one contemplates itself and thus it produces the intellect. The intellect contemplates the one and thus it produces the soul. The soul contemplates the intellect and accordingly it produces the corporeal entities. In this begetting, the one and the intellect remain unchanged, but the soul is altered. Question, what happens to the one in this emanation, in emanating these entities? Plotinus says, well, because the one is not a material mass, it doesn't lessen as, uh, as a result of this emanation. Like, there, let's say there is, uh, there is a fire here and... Um, it's not particularly emanation, but I'm using it as an example. Um, the more it gives, the lesser it has. But the one is not like that. Like, the more it emanates, not, nothing changes in the source. It doesn't lessen. Next question. Is this emanation continuous or intermittent? Plotinus says the divine emanation is not intermittent. The one does not bestow its gifts at one moment, only to leave us again. Its giving is without cessation and continues. He says, thanks to the divine emanation, the one is present in the world. Important, the one is present in the world. Which is why he says, two, two examples pointing to this, like um, with this mentality, he says these two things. One, I am trying to make whatsoever is divine within me rise back, rise back up to whatever is divine in the universe. Uh, and he also says, the human beings are living temples in which the divine presence can manifest itself. So basically, the one, the divine, the one manifests himself, emanates within, on, on, onto the world, permeates through the world. But this manifestation uh, is brilliant uh, within, within the humans. Uh, so human beings are the template, uh, are the temples for this emanation. And by the divine, he means this all transcendence, all powerful, omnipresent being, which 
in religion we call God. There has been a criticism, an objection uh, to Plotinus's uh, cosmology. Uh, Corrigan says, uh, in what he calls the problem of degrees of reality, according to Plotinus, the nearer we are to the one, the more we are. Uh, this is actually uh, Plotinus speaking. And Corrigan says, what does Plotinus mean by the more we are? How can one exist or be a human being more or less? Either we exist or we do not. There is no in-between. Uh, here is the underlying assumption. The underlying assumption is that there is a binary possibility of existence. Plotinus does not seem to have a binary mentality. When he says the nearer we are to the one, the more we are. Um, he doesn't mean that either we are or we are not. That's not what he has in mind when he says the sentence. Plotinus seems to be saying that uh, the nearer we are to the one, the more of our potentials are actualized. Uh, we have lots of potentials, um, and a limited number of them are actualized in this world, in this material world. In the Platinian cosmology, when we rise to the level of this all, capital, um, more of these uh, talents, more of these potential or potentials are actualized. And it even increases when we rise to the level of intellect. And the closer so we are to the one, the more we are. Not that there is a binary thing, like either we are or we are not. This is what uh, I think Plotinus has in mind. Now let's discuss the three primal hypotheses in detail. The third hypothesis, the soul, the capital. Um, and Plotinus explains it this way. He says the soul is word and deed of the intelligence. And uh, the intelligence is what some translators use instead of the intellect. Some also translate it as uh, the spirit. He says, uh, the soul's higher part contemplates its maker, that is, the intellect. And doing so, according to Plotinus, it possesses the object of its contemplation within itself and as itself. And it is then wholly active. Uh, its lower part manages the lower world, the material world. When it contemplates itself, it preserves itself. Uh, so, although Plotinus is using the word part, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were, uh, the soul is divided into parts. It's just a figure of speech. So the soul's higher part contemplates the intellect. And when it does so, it possesses the objects of contemplation in itself and as itself. And its lower part is like managing the world. We will talk about that. Then he gives a very interesting example about the soul world relation. He says the cosmos is like a net thrown into the sea. Already the sea is spread out and the net spreads with it as far as it can. So there is a sea, we throw a net. So that net is the cosmos, that sea is uh, the soul. So um, because the soul is uh, very large, because the sea is very large, it can uh, contain the net. The, the sea is able to encompass it. So that's why he says, already, uh, already the sea is spread out and the net spreads with it as far as it can. Because it has no size, the soul's nature is sufficiently ample to contain the whole cosmic body in one and the same grasp. The cosmos extends as far as the soul goes. Question, uh, does the soul walk into the sensual, sensual world? No, says Plotinus. He says, the soul controls the sensual world through the individual souls. So consider the soul capital as the hypothesis. It also has minions, if you will, and those minions are like a particular individual souls. So uh, the, 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 this soul uh, controls uh, the material world through these particular souls, through these individual souls. He gives another example about the soul-body relation. He says, this is a very interesting example. As we have a part of our body contained in the body, we are like a man whose feet are immersed in water, while the rest of his body remains above it. So let's say there is a lake, a river, let's say, a shallow one, uh, and I'm standing in that river, uh, right in the middle. Uh, the water goes like up, on, up above my feet, and the rest of my body is uh, outside the water. So in this example, what Plotinus is saying is this, 
um, the part that is within the water, that is my feet, is consider this as my as my body in this world, and the part that is outside the water is myself in the higher worlds. Um, this is the picture, and it's a very interesting picture. Question: Are individual souls parts of the soul? Again, we said no. Plotinus says souls are all alike and complete. The soul, capital, ought to be everywhere the same, everywhere entire, one and present in many beings at one and the same time. It's not that it breaks into parts with regard to every individual. It is um, omnipresent. No matter how many individuals there are, it, uh, it, it, it penetrates them uh, without breaking into parts all up all at the same time again consider the net and sea example uh, the soul of a tree says plotinus and every incident of its growth is according to a schedule predetermined sorry determined in advance and this is um this is a passage where he doesn't explain much and i find it problematic for example what is this schedule according to which a soul manages a, a living thing does each being have a, ha, does each being have a fixed entity? If so, the problem of free will surfaces here, a problem that he leaves unexamined. Uh, the second hypothesis, the intellect. Um, the question is this: Actually, Plotinus asks himself, why should there be an intellect? Is the soul the capital not enough? He says the soul is a changing entity. This is his answer. Uh, for it to exist, there must be something unchanging and prior also the soul is in the sensual world there must be an entity outside this world on which the soul depends therefore he says the soul's begetter form giver prior and superior is the intellect so uh, the soul itself is unable to sustain itself with the power of its unity it's, it needs higher being it needs a higher level of unity as its organizing principle and that higher unity uh, is that of the intellect or like i said also translated as the intelligence the spirit what is the nature of the intellect the intellect is both the subject and the object um, we will talk about this more so let me not let me not dwell on it so much uh, let me pass we will talk about this unlike the soul the intellect contains everything in an unchanging identity and eternal presence there is no past there is no future in the intellect there is no time there everything is in an eternal present uh, there is no before there is no after given that the one is beyond the intellect some might ask how does the intellect reach the one and this is a very good question and to which O'Brien answers, um, to, there are two capacities of intellect. One is to know in, um, in Greek, that is the ability to act as intellect, uh, by which in possession of its faculties it holds what is within it, like it possesses what is within it. It's called to know in, in, in Greek. And there's another capacity of the intellect that is called to menoin, that is the ability not to act as an intellect, but by which inebriated, that is drunken, and outside itself, it attains to what is beyond it. It is the second capacity of the intellect through which it attains the one, it reaches the one, it experiences the one. With the first one, it cannot, um, because the one is beyond the intellect. Um, for intellect to comprehend something, it needs to possesses, possess it within itself. And it's not possible about the one. So uh, it's not in the first capacity, rather it's in the second capacity that the intellect uh, reaches the one. Now we come to the part that I said I will explain. Uh, the intellect, capital, itself has individual intellects. Uh, the, in the intellect perceives the intellects, individual intellects within it, as itself, um, as in itself. So let's say uh, the intellect is the mind, and the, there are intelligible entities within that intellect. Uh, uh, they are not normally ideas, because for idea, for you to have an idea, it means that it is outside you, it is beyond you, and you are having them as an idea, as a picture idea. But this is not what intellect does. The intellect 
contains those intelligible entities. It is, in one sense, those intelligent entities. Uh, or put differently, those intelligible entities are all the intellect and yet distinct. We will talk about that. Now, according to Plotinus, uh, the intellect existed before the world of senses, uh, the intellects, individual intellects. They are the archetypes of sensible things. So the intelligible entities, Plotinus says, are the archetypes through which the, uh, the, the, the sensual, the corporeal entities are created, have the way that they have come into existence. There is an essence, there is an archetype up here in the mind, according to which, according to which uh, you see the entities in this world. And uh, they constitute the true being or reality of the spirit or the intellect. They are not in space because they do not have magnitude. They are not prior to it, to the intellect, and they are not after it. Now, uh, one of the commentators on uh, Plotinus' work is Hadot. And Hadot has a very interesting example about these intellects. Um, he says, intellects are the sources of direct and immediate knowledge. Um, and for it to be comprehensible, consider this, says Hadot. Um, in the past, people used uh, hieroglyphs uh, to, to transfer uh, the information, to understand things. Now, today, we use words, we use sentences, we use arguments, and we use step-by-step -step, um, syllogisms, like uh, we have to suffer through the steps of reasoning, to be able to express something and to be able to understand something. For example, I say uh, the sun uh, is a planet. Sentence number one, I moved another step. I say it is yellow, it is bright, it is hot, it enlightens everything around it, it gives life, it is large. So all those sentences. Um, now, I transferred what I wanted to transfer, but uh, says had it, uh, instead of going through suffering through those, those steps, I could simply draw a circle with those pointy lines around it, color it yellow. So when you look at it at one and the same grasp, you understand all the information I just gave you without suffering through those steps. Huh? So in the past, people used hieroglyphs to transfer the ideas. And um, basically, you also see these in caves from the past. So he says uh, the intelligible entities, that is the individual intellects within the intellect, uh, are like those hieroglyphs. When the soul attains to that level, when the soul reaches that level, uh, the soul does not go through reasoning to understand things. It understands them in one and the same grasp. And this is a very enlightening example. Uh, now, according to Plotinus, intellects are one yet separate. One in the sense that intellects are none other than the intellect, like we said, and separate in the sense that each intellect has a distinct feature. Uh, it's like the generic term knowledge. Uh, for example, knowledge is the generic term, an uh, umbrella term. Within it, it has math, biology, physics. Every single one of those disciplines are knowledge yet distinct. One in the sense that those disciplines are none other than knowledge and they are different in the sense of their particularity on uh, the particular direction, the particular thing they are uh, directed towards. So it is in this sense that Plotinus says that intellects or the intelligible entities are one yet separate. The intellects are not parts of the intellect, says Plotinus. Being in the intellect, intelligible entities, are mutually inclusive. They exist in themselves because they do not have space and they do not have differences per se. So they exist in each other. Each is the whole under a particular form. I'm going to repeat that. Each is the whole under a particular form. The intellect is the totality of intellects in actuality and each of them potentially. I'm going to repeat that as well because this is really important. The intellect is the totality of intellects in actuality and each of them potentially. Um, and like I said, this is the general picture. There are entities in this world, but those entities are not other than the intellect itself, because if it were, if they were, it would be outside intellect, beyond intellect. If there were something separate, something distinct from the intellect, 
the intellect would not have been able to possess them even the intellect would have had the, their ideas for example there is a tree outside this window and i don't possess it within myself i have it i have an idea of it it is in my mind but that's all i don't possess it the intellect does not work in this way the intellect possesses things in itself that is why those things cannot be outside the intellect another interesting part the self consciousness and presence uh, according to Plotinus, the self has different levels. Our true self, he says, dwells in the intellect. Our self, this is Hadet speaking on behalf of Plotinus. Our self extends from God to matter, since we are up above at the same time as we are down here on the earth. Our true self, this self in God, is our self within the divine thought. Again, consider that the example that he gave us uh, earlier, uh, you're standing um, right in the middle of a river, the water comes up by your feet, so that part of you inside the water is your material world life. The part that extends beyond that water is your true self, and it goes up. Uh, and Plotin says it goes up, up above, it, it extends from God to matter. It is the matter part that we perceive, but it is also in the divine thought that is in the intellect and that is our true self now here is the question you're going to ask me you're going to say that's all okay fine even if we admit this given that this is the case why are we not aware of what is going on up there why are we not conscious of our uh, true self Plotinus says such activities are known only when perceptible by sensation Otherwise, they are not communicated to the entire soul, and thus we are not conscious of them. So for us to be conscious of the activities of our true self, uh, they need to be transmitted to the sensual world. When they're not, we're not aware of them. And this is a very interesting text from Hadith. He says, our consciousness requires us to split into two, for there must be a temporal difference. Uh, between that which is that between that which sees and that uh, which is seen now just consider this for a moment this might be a bit complex but this is very interesting um the way that our minds work our consciousness work uh, works is uh by way of subject object there is a microphone here i am here i'm perceiving it uh, so there is a seer and there is a scene but the way i get this knowledge is through time right even if this time is very infinitesimal, I, when I look at it, I immediately perceive it, but that's not literally immediately. There is a small time period that this knowledge is transferred to my mind. It comes to my eyes, through my retina, it goes to my neural systems, up onto the brain, I say, ha, huh, there, 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 there is a microphone here, but there is a time lapse here. Do you understand what I'm saying? Actually, what Plotinus is saying. And we said earlier that in the intellect, there is no such thing as time. So, which is which is why in the intellect, we are not conscious. This is an amazing thing. When I first read this, I was like fascinated. Uh, so, when you get to the level of the intellect, uh, you are not conscious. You are not, huh, that is this, this is that. Your, your mind, your, your mind up there, your true self does not function as as you do in this world, by syllogism, by reasoning, by consciousness. Um, our true self, however, says uh, Harit, acts differently. It acts in total presence. Huh? This is important. It acts in total presence. It possesses the things, it possesses the ideas it wants to have. Uh, our true self acts in total presence, eternity and perfect simplicity. So when we reach our true self, we lose consciousness, we lose self-awareness. Um, so if, some, if you see someone having a mystical vision, as Protonius says, next to you, all you see is that person faints and you wouldn't understand what is happening. Um, and that fainting is that point. Uh, the person loses consciousness. The person loses sensations at that moment because that's not how you understand things up about. Um, you lose your sensation, you lose your self-awareness, you lose your consciousness, and up about, subject, object, duality disappears, and you unite with the intelligible entities when you comprehend them. We come to the most important part, the first hypostasis, the one. Although Plotinus names the strictly nameless 
as he calls it, uh, the one. He wants us, he warns us about this usage. He says, look, I'm, 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 I'm using the terminology, the one, to describe something that is strictly nameless. <laughs> Even the one itself is not accurate to be used. He says, the word is useful solely in getting the inquiry started aright to the extent that it designates absolute simplicity. He says, I'm using the word the one only because it conveys simplicity. That's all. He says the one is not identical with the soul. Um, it's not identical with being. It's not identical with intellect. Neither it is identical with existence or essence. Why is the one not identical with the soul? Well, for Plotinus, the soul is a contingent being. It depends on another being, a higher being, for its unity, as its organizing principle, that is the intellect. But based on the definition that uh, Plotinus gives us, the one cannot be dependent on another being. It's uh, self-sustaining. It's independent. Uh, it is not being. It is not intellect. So basically, intellect and being in the Plotinian cosmology are almost the same thing. Um, it's just a little bit complicated and beyond the scope of this video. So let's for now consider being and intellect the same. So he says uh, the one is not being because being has the form of being and the one does not have a form. Therefore, the one is not being. Then he says the one is not identical with the intellect because the essence of the intellect is subject-object duality. Uh, there is a duality up there, and uh, the one is beyond duality, beyond subject-object. Therefore, it cannot be the intellect. Also, in the intellect, even though we say they are um, this, the intellect themselves, but there are also distinctions between the intelligible entities. As I said, the intellect and intelligible entities are the same in the sense that they are none other than each other. But there are still distinctions that each one is uh, directed towards a particular uh, feature. Uh, and the one does not tolerate that. The one does not tolerate multiplicity. Plotinus says the one is not identical with existence or essence uh, because existence and essence bring determination and the one is not determined and determinable. Therefore, the one is not uh, either one of these. So how do we know the one? We ask Plotinus, to which his answer is, awareness of the one comes to us neither by knowing nor by the pure thought, but by a presence transcending knowledge. A presence transcending knowledge. Do not look for knowing the one through, through thought, through consciousness. You're not going to be able to do that. Um, when you get to that mystical vision, he says, uh, it is a presence that you feel. It is a union. So like I said, the, the, the way to know higher order things is not by knowing through subject-object duality. Their subject-object duality disappears and you, and you unite um, with the one to be able to understand it. How do you do that? Through hypostasis. Your individual soul connects to the soul, the third hypostasis. From there, it reaches uh, the intellect, the second hypothesis, and through the intellect, it connects to the one, it gets to that unity. So Plotinus says it is by the hypothesis that a hypothesis is seen. So you can't just jump in and just go around this hypothesis. It is how you connect to them. You become the soul, become the soul. You then, through that, become the intellect, and through the intellect, you unite with the one. He says, and again, this is very important, using discursive reason to speak about the one, the principus is not uh, for you to be able to understand everything or for us to be able to explain everything. He says, the sole purpose is to direct the seeker towards the vision. He says, I'm not writing philosophy in the analytical sense to convince you through the syllogism and uh, saying, look, premise, 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 conclusion, therefore accept that there is the one. He says, oh, I'm not doing that because the, absolutely, because discursive reason is limited. And how can you ever, this is me speaking, not Plotinus, how can you ever expect to, to, to fully understand something uh, that is not limited with something that is limited and you know it? 
And uh, that is the case with uh, discursive reason. Discursive reason is limited, therefore it cannot understand something that is unlimited. So why are we speaking? Should we abandon it? No, says Plotinus. He says we should use discursive reason, but to convince you, to direct you towards that vision. And it is in that vision that you get in touch with the one. Plotinus says, when the soul knows, I'm emphasizing, knows something, it loses its unity. It cannot remain simply one. The soul then misses the one and falls into number and multiplicity. I already explained this. Thus, will the one be seen as far as it can become an object of contemplation? Not the object of knowledge, but the object of contemplation. Then he brings up something very, very influential, like the, the, the topic we're going to discuss uh, just immediately penetrated uh, the whole metaphysics, be it Greek, be it Islamic, or any other tradition. The concept of the center of the soul. He says, the three hypostases are like one, the one, the intellect, the soul. But they are also in very nature of things. They are also in us. What are those? He says, they are the soul, the individual soul that we have, the intellect, and the center of the soul. What is the center of the soul? Uh, for In the Platinian cosmology, the center of the soul is the placeless point. Placeless point where the soul meets the one. The soul should seek the principle upon which all centers converge. So he's saying that there is a center, but not a physical center, not a geometric center, geometric point. He says uh, there is a primordial nature in your soul, a meeting place where you meet the one. Um, and that is not the center itself is not this play is not what you should be seeking um i have a center of the soul you have a center of the soul and everybody has but consider this as a circle with a center there is a circle here there is a circle here but consider this when these circles come together all of them all of them can meet in one single point as their center correct it doesn't matter what, how big the radius is. If the radius is this big, the diameter through radius is this big. If it is this big, it doesn't matter. The center is the center. They can all unite. They can all converge in one point. And he says, every one of us can uh, converge at that center of the soul with the one, with one, one in that center of the soul. Question, how should the soul make its return? How should the soul reach the one? Um, according to Latinus, uh, we were up there in what he calls the fatherland, in the higher world. And then we were descended to this world, and we should make the return. How? He says, through a turning inward. Um, what guides us in this inward journey? He says, the soul. The soul guides us in this inward retreat. How? Tune down the sensual and listen to the voices from within. He says, the matter itself is not evil, so it's not right to consider matter evil in itself, but our preoccupation, our obsession with matter is evil, um, in the sense that it deprives us, distracts us from the higher world. He says, instead of being obsessed with the things here below in the lower world, just get them as much as you need, just get the essentials, and focus upstairs, uh, tune down, as he says, the sensual, and focus on the higher world. This is how the door will open. The intellective thinking being is in the presence of its object by virtue of its similarity and identity, and it is united with its kindred, and with nothing to separate it from them, when there is no difference. Uh, consider this. We said in the higher world, there is no subject-object duality, and if you want to understand uh, if you want to comprehend things up there, uh, you should unite with them. But how? He says, through similarity. In order to be able to unite with the intelligible entities up there, uh, you should be similar with them. If there is a distinction, if there is a me and you, we are not the same. We are not one. We are, we are, we are separate. So we should lose our uh, differences. How? He says, there is beauty up there. So if you want to reach the beauty, you should be beautiful yourself. If you want to reach the light, you sh your soul should be decorated.
and enlightened by the virtuosity, by beauty, by ethics. So in order to meet the one, you should, in order to meet the good, another name for the one, in order to meet the good, in order to unite with the good, you should be good yourself. So in, in, in conclusion, if you want to see the beautiful, if you want to unite with the beautiful, you should see, be beautiful yourself. It says you should be a virtuous person. Now, in the mystical vision, the contemplative is absorbed into the one. Uh, th this is so beautiful, this part. He gets to perfect at oneness with the one. Or the contemplative ones with the one. I'm, he, we are using the word one as a verb here. He wants with the one. In this state, the contemplative is the image of the one. This is the end of the flight of the lone to the alone. This is the unity of the soul with the one. Such experience is a self-transcendence. It's a simplification. It's a self-abandonment. You, you, you lose yourself. You, you unite with the one. Actually, there is no you anymore. So the subject, objectuality disappears. Um, this is, uh, now that, that was the general picture of this theory, um, but this is an interesting conclusion that I could draw. Although Plotinus guides us towards otherworldliness, he is, um, a kinness argument, that is, be good to see the good, uh, guides you to worldly virtuosity and ethics as well. Yes, he is speaking in a mystical language, he is, uh, directing us towards the vision, but at the same time, he's helping us uh, to have a virtuous and ethical life in, in this material world. And that's something interesting I found in his writings. Now, um, is this theory credible or not from a philosophical point of view? I will not tell you my answer, but you should be very careful here because of this. We should not consider Plotinus or Ibn Arabi or other mystical writers writing just from the uh, philosophical point of view. It's not analytical philosophy. It's not that we sit, we think, we bring our thoughts on paper, we say premise, 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 conclusion, therefore we should accept this. That's not what they're doing. Um, what they're doing is um, they, through the mystical experience, they get the information, huh? they are transferring those information to us, it is only in this transferring parts that they use philosophy. Huh? They get the information through intuition, through vision, not through philosophy. It is in their explanation, in their description, that they bother to use philosophy. So if we try to understand and reject their thought, we are doing injustice because they are saying explicitly that this is not what we come up with through philosophy. They come to us through uh, divine intuition and we express them through uh, discursive reason language. So have this in your mind. Um, philosophy is not all that there is to the Platinian or Ibn Arabian thought. Thank you so much for watching this. I hope I could give you a, a clear picture of the Platinian cosmology uh, in his theory of emanation and unity of the soul with the one. Um, this matter is of course too deep uh, to be able to express it, as one, express it in one or two hours. This was just an introduction for you to see what's going on in his thought. Um, and hopefully it will be a first step for you to take the second and third steps. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I did. And uh, stay tuned for the other videos.